Hi, everybody. Welcome to Horsepower Heritage. I'm Maurice Merrick. And greetings to all of you listening from places like Poughkeepsie, New York, Mingo Junction, Ohio, North Hollywood, California, Durban, South Africa, Zelezny Gordon, Poland, and Istanbul, not Constantinople. Thanks for being here and share the show with your friends because I'm on a mission each week to give you the best podcast for every gearhead out there, whether they're on two wheels or four. So if you're new to the show, check out the back catalog. Lots of good stuff for you there. Smash that follow button, hit that five-star rating, maybe leave a quick review. And all those things will help me reach more gearheads like you. All right, well, with that business out of the way, today we're talking vintage racing with my guest, Eric Bruton. Eric is a classic and racing car broker in Paris, and he drives in vintage racing events like the Le Mans Classic. I've got some links in the show notes for you to check out, so stick around because if you're already a big fan of vintage motorsport, or maybe you've even thought about getting into it yourself, you're going to hear how it's done today. And that's coming up right after this. This episode of Horsepower Heritage is sponsored by Model Citizen Diecast. Maybe you can't afford that Shelby 289 Cobra or that Porsche 356 Speedster, but having a scale model on the shelf is easy with Model Citizen Diecast. They stock collector-grade scale models in 143rd scale, 118th scale, and even the massive 18th scale masterpieces from the Amalgam Collection. And if you use the promo code HERITAGE at checkout, they'll give you 10% off your order. Limitations apply. Just visit ModelCitizenDieCast.com and check out their great selection. From race cars to classic cars and everything in between. Model Citizen Diecast. Because your inner child still wants to play with cars. And now my interview with Eric Bruton, right here on Horsepower Heritage. Eric Bruton, thank you for joining me. That's a pleasure, Maurice. Thank you for having me. Of course. Eric, you're quite a car enthusiast, and many, many interesting cars have passed through your hands. Of course, you buy and sell classic cars, and you also do vintage racing, which is very interesting to me. And I just wonder how how it all came about for you. I'm always interested in the evolution of a car enthusiast. Well, um, I've always been a car nut, as far as I can remember. It all started with my father. You know, he, he couldn't buy, you know, fancy cars, or didn't have the means, but he was very interested and very passionate about cars. So that would translate at home with many magazines and books and, and, and stuff like that around cars. And something I remember fondly, I was maybe seven or eight years old. In France, we have a magazine called L'Auto Journal. And uh, once a year in September, they would, uh, release a special issue with all the cars of the world. And I was waiting for that magazine when I, when I was a kid, you know, I was waiting for it because that's the magazine I would read and reread times and times again, you know, and uh, I think at seven or eight, I would know all the cars and the max power and the max in the top speed of every car. That was, that was my thing. The numbers, you know, the, the power, I was very interested in the power, the displacement, the top speed, you know, that, that kind of stuff that you, you can see on magazine, but also on, on cards, you know, the cards you, you play with the cards that you, you know, the best car is the, the one that has the, the best top speed and so on. So yeah, yeah, definitely a car nuts at, uh, at six or seven. Yeah. Very few people understand how important France is to the development of the automobile. A lot of things happened in France first. Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, you know, France is a small country, uh, We've done great things, I would say, probably. Uh, it's, not a, it's not always the case. Uh, but speaking about automobile, yeah, Peugeot was, uh, you know, one of, one of the uh, earliest. Uh, the, the, you know, the French pre-war manufacturers, bodywork, uh, designers, and so on, were one of the greatest in the world at, the, at that time. And uh, I like to think that uh, we've been uh, pioneers in many technologies like, uh, you know, turbocharging, Renault, the first one in Formula 1 with a turbo, um, you know, Peugeot has won the, the, the world championship several times in, in rallying. So there's, yeah, there's a, I think France is a, is a great nation of, of motorsport as is the uh, United States or, uh, or England. Uh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, Peugeot, Renault, Citroën, uh, Bugatti, right? Bugatti. Yeah. Let's not yeah. forget <laughs> the big one. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Eric, I understand you worked for Peugeot at one time. I'm, I'm an engineer in uh, computer science. I'm not very fan of computer science, to be honest. I realized that once I had my uh, diploma in, in, in hands. And uh, 
And I said, I want to I wanna work in the automotive world um, one way or another. So I managed to get a job at, uh, at Peugeot, which was uh, the first French manufacturer. And, um, and I was doing uh, softwares dedicated to um, testing the then new embedded electronic systems and, uh, and you know, ECUs that are talked together and so on. So, um, but it was a bit far from the product, from the car itself. So I got bored quite quickly. I mean, uh, well, quickly not. Uh, uh, you know, I stayed there for five or six years. And then I was always, that, that has always been my, uh, my goal to find a, a work or job in, in which I could, uh, I could use my passion. What caused you finally to leave Peugeot? Well, I, I, you know, I was looking for another position at Peugeot, which would take me closer to the product. And uh, my goal was to, uh, to be hired in a department that would uh, test the cars of the uh, competitors, uh, so the other brands. And I was very much interested in that. And I waited like six months. They, you know, uh, my boss said, yeah, yeah, you will have it. And, uh, and I waited six months and nothing came. So at some point I said, okay, I'm, I'm leaving. I had a job for, t- for two years in a... Uh, Again, around computer science, nothing to do with cars. So it lasted two years. And, and, and after that, I said, okay, now that's time to, uh, to do something on my own. I can say now uh, that I was not ready. <laughs> it was not the right time neither. And, and I did mistakes. And, uh, and my company only lasted for two and a half years. Uh, I lost a lot of money, but I learned a lot at the same time. When I came back to cars uh, very quickly, I guess it was uh, one, one year later, I worked for a guy in, in Switzerland who was into selling classic cars and high-end cars. And um, then I thought it would last, you know, a couple of years and I, and I stayed six or seven years. And after that, I said, well, now I'm ready, that's time. And uh, I founded my, uh, my second company nine years ago. And that, of course, is Eric Bruton Classic Cars. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's yes. it. Wonderful. Eric, what's your favorite era of automobile? I think you gravitate very much toward uh, late 60s and the 70s. Is that right? Yeah, that's. Uh, well, it's always difficult to tell because I, I, I really think that in every decade of, mo- of motorsport, th- there's an interesting moment or interesting cars or interesting drivers. But th- the one I like the most is, is, you're right, late 60s, 70s is really my favorite era. Also, because not only... Because of cars, because, because, you know, the 70s, it's also the music, the, the clothes, the, you know, many things that I like in the, in the 70s. And yeah, the cars were, you know, there was a time where uh, you had freedom in the, in the regulations. The, the car was, were absolutely bonkers. And, uh, but I also like 80s. I, I, you know, I also like GTM in the 90s. I also like GT racing of the 90s. So yeah, kind of, uh, kind of everything. But yeah, 70s, definitely my favorite. Tell me about the ups and downs of selling collector cars and classic cars. That's a tri- tricky question, but I would say I- I'm a small uh, structure. You know, I'm a, I'm a small business. I'm not a big player. In, uh, I like to, to think that I, I, can, uh, I can find very, very high in cars, very rare cars, and I'm, and I'm proud of that. But I'm not the big company uh, advertising everywhere, doing shows and so on. So, so when the market is down, it's difficult, you know, to find new buyers to bring a dynamic to the market. That that was the case the the last uh, eighteen months, I would say. So that would be the, the main down. Everything else is up. You know, uh, living is passion is uh, is something really really special. I, I'm lucky to to have a, a partner that is also my best my best friend Benjamin, who is running the the garage in Paris. I'm lucky enough to work most of the time from home, uh, unless when I travel, checking cars and, and meeting uh, clients. So that's really a way of life that, that I like, and uh, I think it's a, it's a well balance between uh, between my job and my uh, my private life. I think too, you know, it's a business that relies heavily on the passions of people. It's not as if they're buying appliances; they're buying something that really speaks to them emotionally. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, will, I often say, if if you're not passionate, if you're not a car you, you can't do this. You know, it's 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 as simple as that. Uh, you have to. It's it's kind of cliche saying, you know, everybody says, "Oh, I'm, I'm passionate," and but really, if you you know, when I when I find a new car, I decide to say, "Well, one day I wake up and say, I have to find something really special." I, I would have two or three customers for a special car. What what can I find? You have to read books. You have to remember the the, the, the movies you find, the races you've uh, you've looked at, you've watched when you were kids, that kind of stuff. So really, I, th- I think that's a, that's a job for someone who's uh, who's passionate, definitely. 
Eric, you've had about 15 years in the classic car business. And when did uh, French Speed Connection begin? Oh, yeah, French Speed Connection. Y you know, we, uh, when you're passionate about something, especially racing cars, uh, selling them, finding them, uh, doing the history, finding uh, some missing parts and so on is, is really fun. But at some point, you want to, you know, sit in the, in the bucket seat and, uh, and have a drive. So uh, <laughs> at some point, you have to meet your customers, you, you know, not only ringing them and said, oh, I'm going to come next week uh, uh, to your home and check the cars and speak and talk. And no, uh, it was a good thing to be part of the big uh, vintage racing circus. So I had a car at that time. I sold it and, uh, and, and we bought uh, a 67 Camaro and, uh, and we entered the... Uh, the then new Heritage Touring Cup Championship uh, by uh, Peter Otto. That was the start of, uh, of a French Speed Connection. Tell me a little bit about Peter. Uh, well, I guess Peter Otto is, is one of the main, if not the main, vintage race organizer in, uh, in Europe. They are doing a great job with fantastic races all over Europe. You've heard about Le Mans Classic, obviously, one of uh, Peter Otto's gem. They also uh, do the, the French Tour Auto. Five days competition with mix of uh, of road stages and, uh, and and track racing. That's uh, that's fantastic. And so they have uh, every weekend of races. They have uh, six or seven uh, race weekends a year. You have uh, many different grids in the same weekends, ranging from uh, 50s classic to uh, 90s uh, 2000 GT cars. The Heritage Touring Cup Championship I was mentioning earlier is. Um, it's a championship for uh, touring cars ranging from 66 uh, to uh, 84. So you will find some BMWs, Fords, Chevrolet, cars like that. That's fantastic. And by the way, your Camaro is really impressive. Now that car has a period race history. Yeah, it's, uh, this car is fantastic. because It's been racing since 1971 each year. So that, that's, you know, that's pretty amazing. Uh, 50 years of racing nonstop. Uh, it's been through uh, some hard times, like uh, all racing cars. It's been rebuilt uh, quite a few times. And yeah, we, we're very, uh, very happy uh, with this car. Um, unfortunately, I have to say that it's, it's, it's now gone to a new home. It's very recent. but uh, So we are taking the, the next stages of our racing adventure with another car next year. Uh, but the Camaro, yes, was uh, it's, it's a great car. It was a, a, bit, uh, a bit of a big car to start with, I would say. Because obviously the first race we did was uh, with a BMW uh, three liter CSL that was a little bit under prepared, under powered, under everything. But it was nevertheless a great start in in vintage racing. And when we um, we jumped in the in the Camaro a few months later, it was a bit of a shock because uh, it was a complete different story, and we we were not pro driver whatsoever. So it was very interesting to you know to grow up in uh, to in terms of uh, driving with uh, together with the car. It was a unique uh, experience. Yeah, quite a powerful car to start with. Yeah, yeah, 465 horsepower from the uh, 302 uh, V8. That's quite powerful. That's quite heavy too. So that brings uh, some difficulties in terms of driving, especially big understeering in the tight corners. And as you know, the brakes have uh, never been the, the number one force of an American car. So uh, you have to cope with that. But it, that, that's what makes the car interesting because uh, it has a lot of power. That's one thing. But uh, you have to, to cope with it and to adapt your driving to, uh, to the car uh, abilities too. It must be very exciting to drift that Camaro through the corners. Yeah, it, you know, it, it drifts for sure, but but not that much. You know, you, you you know, when we talk to people, they always say, "Oh, these American cars, they you know, they always go uh, you know square on the corners, and uh, the back end is uh, is uncontrollable." And uh, that that's not the case. In fact, these cars, when they are properly prepared, this car was uh, prepared as a as a Trans Am spec uh, back in the days. It, it rests only in SCCA. A sedan, but it was meant to to be driven in uh, in Trans Am. Well, they, they work very well. Only that that nose was uh, uh, a bit heavy, and uh, and that understeer that you know slows you down drastically in the in the slow corners. Apart from that, it has a very good uh, handling. That's good. I've seen the Trans Am cars at Laguna Seca many times. Ah, great! It's very exciting to watch them, especially coming through the corkscrew. Of course, yeah, yeah. That's uh, the Laguna Seca is on our bucket list of uh, of tracks that we have to do one day. Yeah, definitely. 
Yes, you should definitely come over. I think you would love it. Eric, tell me about learning how to race a car. Did you go to a racing school? Did you did someone take you under their wing? No, we, we weren't. Uh, we haven't attended uh, any driving school, but th- that that's the beauty of being uh, two friends, uh, you know, and two co drivers, two drivers, uh, because you can can exchange on how you do things and how you feel things. And uh, nowadays, you always have one or two cameras in the car that all, also helps a lot. We were doing uh, uh, track days and stuff like that with uh, with performance cars, not not classic cars, but we had already uh, made a first step into uh, into racing. But that was not enough uh, to to start uh, with confidence and and beat every everyone else from the start. No, not at all. But you learn, you learn, you you know, you listen, you watch, you ask questions uh, to fellow racing drivers, and and at some point you finish six overall, and uh, and many times in the top ten. So that was uh, that was really rewarding, you know. Absolutely. How many cars are in the field typically in uh, the vintage racing classes? Yeah, in the Heritage Touring Cup, um, w- w- which is one of the biggest breed of the weekend, we are around fifty cars. So that's fifty cars in one class, or that's multiple yeah, class. Fifty cars in one class. So during the weekend, you have between two hundred and fifty, three hundred uh, cars on the track. That's exciting. Are there certain cars that you really enjoy racing alongside? Certain cars that you find the competition with is more interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, you know wh- what's really interesting in in this kind of uh, of championships is that uh, the eligibility is quite uh, wide. I mean, uh, from sixty six to eighty four, you 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 know you face uh, cars that are very different in terms of of design, of power, of, uh, of everything. So that's that's really interesting to compete with more modern BMW six three five Group A, for instance. It's it's a completely it, you know it's another world from the nineteen sixty seven Camaro in terms of uh, handling brakes, but nevertheless. Uh, at the end of the day, you can beat them. So that's uh, that's uh, what makes it uh, really fun and uh, and entertaining. As they say, there's no replacement for large displacement. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what we think. Uh, not everybody agree on that, but uh, yeah, absolutely. We love we love big engines, and they sound so good coming down the back straight or whatever. They're just you know wide open throttle. I love it. Oh yeah, and the three hundred two cubic inch, the the five liter Transam spec engine is a is a blast because it it revs. Unlike uh, unlike other V eight, you can reach eight thousand RPM with it, so it's it's crazy. You have best of both worlds in this uh, in this engine. Are you allowed to use modern materials in the engine building? For example, do you have lighter weight internal components and so forth? Well, that's uh, that's a tricky question <laughs> because all cars have to be uh, homologated by the uh, FIA uh, and, and and granted with the uh, what they called an HTP, uh, historic technical passport. Uh, otherwise, you're not allowed in in these kind of big events. So every car has to be homologated because, uh, of course, when you look at some cars, you realize that uh, you know there are ways to cheat, as it has always been in uh, in uh, motor racing. Um, so in engine building, you have to uh, comply with the original displacement, so the size of the valves, the, the design of the, uh, the heads and so on. But yeah, you know, you, you will buy new, um, for instance, uh, new valves, you know, the, the, you won't buy all new old, old stock ones or old ones. So uh, yes, yeah, these are modern components. But apart from that, you know, you, you don't have, you know, I said 465 horsepower, I guess, back in the day in, in, in 69 and 70, they already had 500 horsepower. So we're not, you know, we're in the same range. Right, right. Personally, Eric, what are some of the cars that you've personally owned that you really have enjoyed and your, your own stable? <laughs> I guess the, the one that I enjoyed the most uh, for the racing cars, you know, it's, I would say it's the beginning of our adventure. You know, we, we, we have driven quite a lot of them, not owned a lot of them, but my personal car, that, that's the car I sold to uh, finance my uh, racing adventure uh, with my friend Ben. And it was a, a 427 Cobra continuation, Shelby continuation car. And that was my dream car when I, when I was uh, younger. And uh, of course, I couldn't afford a, a genuine one, which uh, were 
already priced more than 1 million US. So, so I bought a continuation car, which, uh, you know, obviously is the closer thing to, uh, to the real thing. And yeah, yeah, that car, I always say if I, if I had the, the opportunity in the future to buy another one, I would definitely because, uh, it's not the kind of car that you daily drive, not at all, but each time you drive it, uh, something happens. What is it that you like about the driving experience in the Cobra? Well, obviously, big engine and, uh, and lightweight, that's a good recipe. With modern tires and proper suspension setup, these are fantastic cars. I mean, these are raw, brutal, yes, but they are drivable, de- definitely. Much more than we think. And, and, and you know, the key is to be humble. Mm. When, you, when you, you know, even if you, if you own it for 10 years, be humble. Because uh, as they say, it can bite and, and it does. So, uh, yeah, each time you drive it, at some point, you will have a, a moment of, uh, you know, anxiety, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what makes, uh, w- what makes it uh, uh, beautiful. You know, that's, uh, that's a, an amazing car. I have a friend who owns a continuation 427 and he loves it. Let's talk about the hunt for cars. How do you start your research? Where do you look? I'm sure you have quite a network of people. But without revealing any of your secrets, maybe, tell us kind of how that process works. Well, there's two ways. Uh, first of all, whether one of my customers one day uh, rings me and say, oh, I'm, I'm looking for such a car. Uh, can you find one? I can't find one. Can you locate one uh, or source one? And so that's, that's when the hunt uh, begins. And the second way is that I would sometimes wake up and say, look, these cars are a bit undervalued or, or they have a great future for some reasons. So I'm going to try to find one and, uh, and then we'll see if uh, amongst my customers, someone's interested. So that's the, the two, you know, two ways the, the, the hunt begins. And then, yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an all a network thing. Friends, trusty people I, I work with and I like to work with you know, all over the world, in the US, in Japan, uh, in Europe to find a car. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's like uh, somebody send you a picture of one car and then you notice that in the background, there's uh, something you're interested in and you ask questions and you, you take a flight and, uh, and, and you find the car. That can happen too. And that's very interesting and exciting when you, uh, you find what you've been asked to, uh, to source. And that's, uh, that's really rewarding. What is your greatest find? Well, the, the, you know, there are, there are several, but uh, that, that was the Italian job Mura, I guess. It was really a great adventure because uh, we, m- we might need another podcast to uh, talk about the full story. But in a few words, I would say that I was a little bit uh, on my own on this and, uh, and it's been quite difficult. But in the end, when you, you know, find the evidences and you, you say, well, that's it. I was right. That, that, that was the car. That, that was really a, a, a nice feeling. Then we, uh, you know, uh, I also found thanks to a friend, uh, Nicolas, in uh, in Switzerland. Uh, we found the very first factory Pantera Group Four, one of fourteen built. That was also quite an adventure because the car had been converted to road car, so it was uh, quite difficult to uh, imagine that it was a, a former racer. You know, I found many uh, BMW CSL that now races in uh, in the States. The Luigi car, the black one. Uh, Luigi was a, a Belgium tuner. Uh, the Luigi Castrol. Livery. Oh, yes. I, I know the car. Yes. So this car, uh, very quickly, I was uh, offered the Lancia Stratos from a collection in, uh, in Italy with my friend Nicholas. And on the picture, we see a you know, nose of a BMW CSL that was painted white, I guess, at that time uh, in the background. And, uh, and we say, hey, if we come have a look at the Stratos, can we, can we just have a look at a BMW on the background? That, that, that might be interesting. And uh, yeah, to make a long story short, the guy thought it was one of the works car, which obviously it wasn't, but it had nevertheless a, a crazy history because it was the European Touring Car Championship winner, the 76 ETCC Championship winner. So we went in Belgium, see Luigi, who was still alive. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't sell the car. I'm pretty sure the, uh, the, the dealer, the Italian dealer who sold it, uh, used our research to do so. But, uh, you know, that's the way it is. No, uh, no, no problem at all. Uh, so yeah, the BMW was, was quite a find. Um, we also found, uh, the, and restored the, uh, ex, um, Nanini Alfa Romeo 155 DTM. I don't know if you're very familiar with the, with DTM racing, which, which is, uh, yeah, this is the German touring car. Absolutely. Yeah. Series. Yeah. 
And in 93, the rules went bonkers when they allowed uh, almost everything. And manufacturers, Mercedes and Alfa Romeo, which was new to the DTM, they brought a car that was absolutely fantastic and won the championship uh, the first year. And uh, we found a car that was long lost from 99 to uh, 2017. And, uh, and we stored it and realized that it was the famous Nanini car, which had uh, a fantastic history. Uh, in, in 94, with that car, Nanini was about to win the championship. And the race before the last, he had to finish within the fifth, first places. And uh, he, had, uh, he had a problem with another Mercedes driver who was called Roland Ash at the time. And he was fifth, so he was uh, virtually champion. But at some point in the slowest corner, Ash hit his car from the back and uh, Nanini slid into the wall. And he was furious and he got that out of the car, you know, in, in very much Italian ways, uh, waving at a marshal, uh, <laughs> insulting everybody around. And he got in, back into the car, went into the pits, uh, new tires on. He, he had no chances to finish the races in the, in the five uh, top places. But nevertheless, he went back on the track. And, and guess what? He waited for Hash to come. And he hit Hash in the back and completely destroyed his car. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, that's the Italian way to... Uh, so that the, this car was called the Vendetta di Nanini. <laughs> Vendetta, Vendetta yeah. di Nanini. I love it. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> funny. That's very cool. Those are great stories and interesting cars. The CSLs are fascinating. Yeah, and, and the racing the racing versions were, were amongst the top cars of, of that era in, uh, in Touring Car Championship. When you see how these cars were built back in the day, uh, the attention to details and, uh, well, German engineering at, uh, at its best, definitely. There's a world apart from the American car, with all due respect, but uh, yeah, the Germans uh, were on, uh, on another level. Fortunately, the, the American cars had something else to offer, uh, starting with the big V8s, but uh, yeah, these cars, the CSLs, they, they were absolutely uh, one of the best and still are in touring car, vintage touring car racing the way the German did build their racing car back in the days. You know, I'm, a, I'm also a fan of, of, of Roger Penske uh, in the States because I think in some ways his approach of preparing cars were quite like what they, the German would do uh, back in the day. You know, like the, the Camaro, when they, when they raced in, in Transam, they would rebuild the car uh, from the ground up. Uh, at every race, the car were immaculate, were perfectly painted and... Uh, Paint don't you know don't make the car faster, but it's that's the way of doing uh, of doing the job, and then and that's the way they were they, this used to work, and and they won. So um, I think that's the the best way to do it. We don't have the means to do to do it uh, now uh, with our small uh, vintage uh, team, but uh, that was something we were really inspired of. Uh, you know, looking at how they uh, they brought Penske in particular the uh, American cars on the, on the top places in in, in these races. It's quite a process to work through the FIA to get uh, your racing certification, right? Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's, it's not an easy task. That's why most of the owners would, uh, would leave that task to the, the guy who prepares their cars because you have to comply with the period uh, specifications. So if you have an homologated car, you just uh, download the uh, homologation sheet of the, of the days and you would try to read that and try to understand what was in the car. Not everything is written. So that's when it becomes tricky because you have to prove if you don't have any other means to do so that your car was equipped with uh, such uh, elements uh, back in the days in period. And you have to comply also with the uh, year of specification because the, the race cars, uh, as you know, would, uh, would uh, evolve and be upgraded from one race to another back in the day. So at some point, uh, especially for the cars who raced for like 10 years, you have to choose one year and comply to that year. So it's not easy because on the, on the homologation sheet, you have everything. You know, manufacturers would homologate many things that they wouldn't use, in fact, back in the day. So you, you're, ten, you're tempted to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this and, oh, I like this gearbox. I'm going to put it on the car, but that doesn't work like that. You have to first realize and, and check what was the car back in the days and how it was built, and then you comply to that. So that, that's, not, that's not easy. And the safety measures are quite, uh, quite known and straightforward with the uh, roll cages, the fuel bladders, and, and uh, fire extinguishers and, and stuff like that. That, that's, that might be the easy, easiest part. Let's talk a little bit about your, your team. What does it take to prepare a car for the weekend? 
Well, it's uh, yeah, you, you know, you have like I said, five or six uh, races a week in a year, and obviously it takes a lot of time. You know, first of all, when we were I would say rookies in the in the uh, Heritage Touring Cup, we had a lot of luck because the first two seasons we had a car that came from the states. We, uh, you know, we had just uh, rebuilt the engine, uh, repainted the car, go through all mechanical components like suspension, brakes, and uh, gearbox and clutch and stuff like that. And for two years, we didn't touch the car. I mean, we would put oil and change the, the spark plugs, and that was it. The car was incredibly reliable. And uh, we said, well, that's what racing is all about. You put oil in the car, you go racing, and that's it. But we were wrong, as you can uh, imagine. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the following seasons, we, uh, we broke several engines, uh, didn't have the right engine builder, uh, would, uh, would make some mistakes. Uh, and uh, and certainly you realize that it, it it costs a lot of money that you have to spend a lot of time on the cars to be sure that everything is sorted out and and that you won't have any any problem with the smallest uh, thing you know uh, like I said you have a, a problem on, on on the ignition it can be um, it can be one hundred dollar parts that uh, that doesn't work and uh, and your weekend is uh, is over so uh, you'd better check before everything uh, because. As I said, a weekend of racing is, is quite expensive, so you don't want to you don't want to retire the first day, uh, you know, in the first lap of the free test. How many guys are on your team? It's it's a very small team. Uh, like I said, my partner Benjamin is uh, is kind of uh, uh, you know the responsible for the, the preparation of the car. He's, uh, he's quite good at uh, maintaining cars and so on. And we have two other guys that work with us for the restoration of the cars that also. Uh, that also help for the, the preparation. We won't do uh, the uh, engine building in house. We would uh, we would use engine builders depending on the on the brand, but uh, we know the, the best people around, so that that's quite an easy uh, an easy thing to do. And we'll do all the rest in house. Yeah. I wish I lived closer to Laguna Seca because I would definitely want to volunteer uh, to work for a vintage race team. I think that would be fantastic fun. Oh yeah, that's. You know that's great. You know the seeing the people. You know entering vintage racing is is a kind of dream for frustrated non-pro driver uh, as I am, and uh, and many people you 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 talk with in vintage racing are too. That's that's not a bad thing, I would say. Uh, it's just that you know you dream of being racing driver when you are uh, a kid, and uh, and you realize that it's not that easy. And and one day you have the opportunity. 30 or 40 years later to uh, jump into a racing car and do proper racing. So that's fantastic. Yeah, that's wonderful. Let, let's talk about getting into vintage racing. If you had to give someone advice on getting into vintage racing, particularly if they want to drive, what would your advice be? First, it's a question of passion. Yes. But first, it's a question of money. What, what budget do you, do you have to enter vintage racing? Really, what's the real budget you have? And then starting from there, you'll choose what the cars, what's the era, what the type of cars you like. You like single seater, you like, uh, you know, GT racing, you like touring car racing. So you have to uh, first, you know, make your own work on, on what's, uh, what turns you on, I would say. Um, and then, uh, then, uh, you know, leaving the car to, to, to pro workshops is a, is a good thing. Uh, because you won't have to worry about anything, uh, you would just uh, show up on the on the racetrack and uh, and, and and then jump in the car and, and drive. Um, but again, it's a lot of money on top of of the car. But it's the is easiest way to to do so. If you can afford that, I would uh, highly uh, advise people to to go that way. Um, but then you know it's, everything's possible. I mean, uh, we've started you know very uh, naively, as I said, uh, with a very reliable car, uh, thinking we uh, you know, why people do hire uh, uh, professional uh, uh, mechanics and and have a, a semi truck with them. We have you know a small trailer, a uh, few tools, uh, and a car that never breaks down. So uh, you know we're the king of the world, but it's not reality. Reality is that you, as I said before. And a lot of work, a lot of dedication to prepare the car. So, you know, if you if you have a full time job in uh, in, in anything anything else but cars, uh, you would have to go through a, a professional uh, workshop to uh, maintain the car for sure. Uh, you know what we haven't spoken about is circuits. Do you have a favorite circuit in France? 
Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, my, my two favorites in France would be uh, Paul Ricard in, in, on the French Riviera and um, and Dijon. These two were uh, ex Formula One track. Uh, Paul Ricard more recently. Uh, I've seen the, the Formula One back again uh, on the French soils, but Dijon was uh, was an historic uh, Formula One track, and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's it's lovely. I mean, uh, I don't know if you ever seen that video from '79. We were talking about Renault a little bit earlier, and the first win of Renault was at Dijon precisely. And uh, but you never seen the winner, in fact, because uh, the second and three were Pironi on the, uh, Villeneuve, sorry, on the on the Ferrari and. Uh, and René Arnoux on the on the Renault. If you find that video, you just you just Google uh, Dijon Arnoux Villeneuve. There was a battle that you you know never forget between the Renault and the Ferrari. You know they would they would pass each other, touch each other, each other on each corner of the track for the five last laps, and it was absolutely bonkers. So uh, yeah, and, th- and this track is very very interesting, very technical. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with Dijon. When you say it's quite technical, oh yeah, because uh, you know it goes up, yeah, up and down. You have a long straight um, going up, so you have and and entering the corner that enters the straight is very difficult. It's a long right and uh, and uh, it's a blind one. So you know, f- first first time you're in, you don't know uh, really where to uh, to place the car. And uh, that, that's the easiest part. And then it, it goes downhill with very tight corners uh, descending. And, and then when you're in the bottom of the circuit, you have a, a little corkscrew, but in the other side, you know, it's, it's going up. Um, also blind, also very slippery, so uh, very technical. And, uh, and yeah, that's one of my favorite tracks in, uh, in France, for sure. Yeah, up and down, you know. That, yeah. That's- Spa is quite like that too. Yeah, yeah. Spa is, is much bigger, is much longer, but it's, it's also one of my favorite. But I guess everybody likes Spa. You know, it's, uh, it's there's so much history around this track. You have uh, you have the Redillon. Have you heard about this corner, which is also uh, uphill? So when you see it on TV, you say, "Oh, yeah, okay, it's going uphill. That's fine." But when you're in the car the first time and you don't see the the top of the hill. You know, you're just like that, trying to, uh, to. No, you don't see, you don't see the top of the hill. So you have to place the car, knowing what the uh, the corner hands on the top. So uh, all the corner hands on the top. So it's yeah, it's it's a really, it's it's a great a great track too. Right, because when you come, oh, you you can't see over the crest of the no of the yeah. yeah, yeah. You you're going, you know, uh, full speed in the when you're going downhill. Uh, and then you have that ready on. It's it's just like you you're climbing uh, a mountain. You know you don't see the top, so it's uh, very difficult to uh, for, for the first time you're in. And it's still one of the the most for me at least the most frightening um, uh, corner of uh, of all tracks because uh, you don't want to make a mistake in, the, in that corner for sure. It, yeah. it doesn't end well. No. What about the Le Mans Classic? Ah, uh, Le Mans Classic. Yeah, that's uh, that's the big one uh, um, for many reasons, but it's the it's a unique opportunity for a non-pro driver to drive on the long the long track. You know that Le Mans, the track of Le Mans, um, um, most of the track is on uh, open roads, so the roads are closed for the for the event, of course. But uh, so the track is on only. Uh, one time a year for the for the regular twenty four hours and um, and every other year for the classic Le Mans. So it's a unique opportunity. Where, you know, you can go to every other uh, tracks in the world and just show up and and with the right car and the, and the right people you can you can drive Le Mans. It's it's more much more difficult than that. So uh, yeah, it was uh, when we did it the first time. It was uh, really a dream come true and uh, and Le Mans is all about uh, also driving at night. You know, when you're, you know, in, in the car and on the Milson Strait at night with no lights, only your, uh, you know, uh, weak uh, headlights on your old car, <laughs> you're by your own. And it's, uh, it's a fantastic feeling. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, just the history under your wheels there is amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely crazy. Yeah. So you were racing the Camaro. What are you going to be racing now that the Camaro is gone? <laughs> Um, before answering that question, I would, I would say that we have raced also other cars that we don't own, but, uh, we, we've, we've had great times with a, 
with the digital meso conserva group four I, I mentioned earlier, um, we are in the process of restoring uh, Porsche 924 GTR, which uh, raced at Le Mans in, uh, in 82 and at Daytona and Zebring. Um, so it's going to be great fun. Recently, we've, uh, we've had a Lamborghini Murcielago RSV, very modern car that is eligible for the new uh, GT championships that I mentioned earlier. So that was great fun. So, but back to the Camaro, we, uh, we are building another car, restoring another car for the moment that will be ready in February, March, probably. Uh, you know, I wouldn't like to disclose to the, to the millions of auditors that uh, will listen to your podcast, but <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be something uh, in the same, um, you know, some, the same ways, big V8 and, uh, and you'll see that it's going to be way faster than uh, than the Camaro. So probably we will be able to compete with the BMW CSLs. That that, that is the goal. We'll see. That's so funny, Eric. Uh, if I ever have millions of listeners, that man, that'll be the day. I love it. <laughs> you'll remember. You'll remember the day when I mentioned it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I well, I'm excited to see what's in store. That's. I'm glad you're keeping me in suspense. I'm going to keep watching. But you, you, I'll keep you updated. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. Well, this hour has flown by. Oh, yeah. Already. Yeah. But I, I, I've i had fun. Is there... Oh, you, you know, you mentioned the Murcielago, and I knew about that, but for whatever reason, I wasn't thinking about it. Can we talk a little bit about Lamborghini? Because I know you're a big Lamborghini fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. How is that on the track? You know, obviously, Lamborghini is not known for its race history. You yes. know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we always talk about the lack of racing history of Lamborghini in the 60s and 70s to promote the streetcar, just like what Ferrari did brilliantly uh, back in the days. But uh, Lamborghini went, went racing more recently, and the uh, Murcielago is, uh, is one of the cars that competed in, in the GT1 class uh, from 2003 to 2011. And... Um, as the new championship uh, called uh, Endurance Racing Legends um, uh, uh, is open to this kind of cars, we were looking at something a bit different. Uh, and uh, we found that Murcielago in, uh, in Japan, because the car was run uh, by a Japanese team uh, back in the day, um, it's one of the, the five RSVs that, that, that have been built. And it's the only one uh, that raced in the 24 hours of Le Mans uh, back in the day, 2010. So it was uh, uh, it was great to first to find this car, then being able to uh, to find the the actual engine builder of this car back in the day was also a, an engineer for the for the team on the, and during the twenty four hours uh, of Le Mans. So we built the engine for us. We had the en- the car uh, uh, prepared to be race race, and we we raced at Le Mans with it on the small track, not the the big one. Uh, it was in June last June. And it was quite an experience because these cars are, are very modern uh, compared to what we used to drive, um, you know, 70s, 80s cars. Uh, this is a 2010 car with sequential gearbox and, uh, and carbon brakes. So it was quite uh, difficult to understand the brakes, first of all, and, and how you warm them up. It's, it's very different from, uh, from the old steel brakes. Uh, and, and, and during the first laps, we weren't able to, to warm the, uh, 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 the brakes at all. So we were like, but what was going on? And, uh, and I had lunch, you know, during the race, I was uh, next to a guy that races in, um, in vintage racing, but, but was a, a pro driver. It's Ralph Kellerners. And, uh, and I said, Ralph, I, uh, if I remember correctly, you drove GT cars with carbon brakes back in the days. And he said, mm, oh, yes, you're right. I was... Uh, Official drivers for Porsche on the on the GT1 and for Toyota on the on the GT1 in, in 99. So oh yeah okay. Uh, how do you warm that that that, that bloody uh, uh, carbon brakes? I said well easy first first lap when you on the warm up lap you 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 grab some speed and you hit the brakes like you've never hit a pedal before, and you do that you know five times six times ten times if you can, and then your brakes are. Uh, uh, are warm and you can use them as they were intended to do. So uh, we did it and it worked. Obviously, it worked. But if you know, if you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> I mean, that was uh, that was fun. That was fun. And then it's 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 a mixed feeling because you you need much more practicing, I guess, on on this type of car to extract the most if you can. Uh, I don't think a non-pro driver can. 
But you have fun and they are easy to drive. You are, you know, um, the sequential gearbox is quite easy to uh, to use, but you have lots of, uh, of aerodynamics on the car and uh, and it, the grip is phenomenal. So it, it's it's really, really difficult. They don't slide. Uh, so it's, it's really difficult to... Uh, uh, to go from 60s, 70s race car to um, up to to these cars, but I, w- I would have liked to to do more practice on this. We'll see in uh, next season if we can. But that, that would be fun. Yeah, much later braking uh, with the Murcia Lago compared. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah. At some point, you you're in the car and you, and you say, "Well, if I could have these brakes on the Camaro, that would be uh, fantastic." <laughs> <laughs> and the throttle steer is 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 not like it is in the Camaro because as you say, you're not, you can't break it free. No. Yeah. 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 That's uh, That's completely different. I mean, uh, I mean, in the end it's a car, but uh, you have, you see, you, you feel the improvements over the, the years, the decades of, of engineering and, and design, but I haven't talked about that, but you like the V8 sound. I, I, I do too, but Believe me, the the V12, the the Lamborghini V12 uh, uh, on on free exhaust pipes, it's it's just uh, it's just bonkers. I'll remember that forever. I mean, uh, the sound is uh, is like no other. Well, and having it right behind you, you must be able to feel it into your chest. And yeah, you definitely feel it. It's it's not you know it's uh, it's not like turbocharged car or when you you feel you know when you you have on boost you 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 feel like you're you're in a, a rocket you know. That's not the case with the Lamorgan. It's uh, you have a big torque in the low RPM and it's going up to uh, uh, seven thousand, not more because of the restrictors. Um, but it's it, no, it's it's all about the sound and the torque on these engines. It's it's really another uh, another thing. Yeah, yeah, that's really exciting. A different kind of excitement on the track, right? Uh, it's oh yeah, from one car to another, it's it's always different. Yeah, yeah. And you wonder how, how these guys are heroes of the 60s and 70s professional drivers. They were racing many different cars from one day to another, you know, and they had a, a great sense of uh, adaptation. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And uh, as non-pro drivers, you're, you're like, you know, I want to have some time with the car. I want to I wanna test. I want to go slowly, you know. And these guys, they were like, okay, I'm going to jump on this and I'm going to, you know, score the second time in qualifying. It's the first time I drive the car, but uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> no, that's another world, definitely. Yeah, you, you realize the huge gulf between the amateur driver and the pro driver, that huge jump in skill level, right? And intuition. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You want to you wanna be uh, as close as, uh, uh, as you can be from the pro driver times because there are lots of pro drivers, ex-pro drivers in the vintage racing uh, races but you feel you feel the difference there are many vintage racers that are very close or on the same level as as ex-pro drivers which is uh absolutely amazing but uh yeah pro drivers uh you know that's a job i mean you'll do it every day and uh, the more you practice the best you are that's uh, that's it well eric thanks for joining me that was a pleasure maurice that was great pleasure it was great fun thank you very much i, I really enjoyed our chat and before we go i just want to mention you can follow eric's classic car and racing car brokerage at ericbruton.com. And if you want to check out the vintage racing, go to frenchspeedconnection.com. And I'll put links in the show notes. Thank you very much, Maurice. It was uh, it was great fun. All right, my friend. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. That's all for this episode of Horsepower Heritage. If you like what you've heard, don't forget to follow the podcast. Tell your friends about it. Leave me five stars and a quick review. And if you want to support the show with a few bucks, just go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash HP Heritage. You can pitch in as little as $2 and that helps keep this great content coming. Always appreciate it. Read articles and watch videos at horsepowerheritage.com. The Instagram is what else but horsepower heritage. And until next time, I'm Maurice Merrick. Thanks for listening.